Thank you, President Barry. Mr. Hubert would have been proud of you. Protocol already having been established, I will dispense with that. I just want to explain a little more about the apologies. The Deputy Speaker, the Honorable Anthony Eden, is off the island for medical reasons. The Speaker, Honorable Juliana O'Connor Connolly, is overseas in Cayman Brac. <laughs> the Honorable Wayne Panton is overseas in Ireland. The Honorable Marco Archer, our Minister of Finance, has sent his apologies. Marco has just completed a major project, which has taken him nine years. He is so overwhelmed with joy at the birth of his first son yesterday that he couldn't be here. His name is Andreas Joshua Archer. And President Barry, Marco said that if, you chamber, if the chamber really cared about the Minister of Finance, they would send his lunch to the hospital where he is still keeping vigil. <laughs> <clears throat> Today, I want to engage you all in a conversation about the progress the government I have the honor to lead is making as we administer the affairs of these islands. I will share with you my thoughts on our broad achievements to date, the challenges facing us, and give you some detail about the plans going forward. If you will, please cast your minds back to those days prior to the 2013 election. Take a few, section, take a few seconds and reflect and then consider how different a place, indeed, how much better a place Cayman is today. I suspect that as you reflect, you will find yourself appreciating the stability and renewal of confidence in government and in the future of Cayman generally. And to this, add to this, the return of a constructive and mutually beneficial relationship with the United Kingdom as well as a more engaged and cooperative partnership between government and the private sector. Then throw into that mix a much improved economy coupled with the restoration of government finances. Ponder these factors for a moment and you get the picture of just how much has been achieved in a little more than two years. The transition from there to here did not occur by accident. It occurred because on election day 2013, the country chose a group of committed people who had a vision and plans for the country and promised good government. And after the election, once a government was formed, we set about creating a plan of action based on our election promises. Ah, that word, promises, promises. I'm reminded of an anecdote about a father reading his young daughter a bedtime story. As soon as he started, the little girl looked up at her father and said, Daddy, do all fairy tales begin with once upon a time? Looking down at her curious face, the wise father responded, No, my dear. There's a whole series of fairy tales that begin with, if elected, I promise. Yes, indeed, the road to government is paved with promises. Making promises, that's the easy part. Delivering on them is the challenge. And as those of you here today know only too well, this is not unique to government. This is also the challenge of business, to convert promises into deliverables that solve the problems or satisfy the needs and wants of customers or constituents. And it is a challenge this government took on, took on in earnest some 28 months ago. And I'm proud to be able to say today, we have been delivering on our promises. This government's success so far has been down to establishing priorities, creating a plan and then being disciplined in its execution. 
adjusting occasionally as needed, but always moving forward. Recently, the government delivered its midterm report to the Legislative Assembly, and as I said then, if you line up the midterm report with our election manifesto, you will quickly see that we are delivering on our promises and plans. To borrow a favorite saying of the Deputy Premier, this is a government that gets things done. Let me give you a few examples. For over a decade, successive governments have talked about upgrading the Owen Roberts International Airport. But we are actually doing it, bringing jobs and a much needed facility to better serve those who fly in and out of Grand Cayman. When complete, you will no longer have to apologize to arriving business colleagues or clients about long lines or overcrowding. Instead, you will proudly listen when they speak of what a fantastic facility we have. Under our watch, the airport redevelopment has been properly planned, financed, and contracts tendered. It has all been done according to best practice, transparently, and by the book. And we broke ground on phase one two weeks ago. Finding a solution to the Georgetown landfill has been talked about for just as long. And like the airport, we are proceeding carefully with the required process under the framework for fiscal responsibility and the public management and finance law. We will ensure we have a solid waste solution for the next 50 years. Along the way, we have conducted various environmental and site investigative works on the landfill sites on all three islands. We have remained transparent throughout, publishing every report when done. Recently, Cabinet approved the National Solid Waste Management Policy after a period of public consultation. This is a major step to arriving at an overall national solid waste management strategy, which will lead to a final agreed waste management solution and identify the options available to government. I am happy to say that the release of the strategy is imminent with plans to get it to the public by late October or early November. The process may seem slow, but it is sure and will bring about the correct outcomes. Another long discussed issue has been reviving the hospitality training school. Again, we have done this working in partnership with the private sector. We recently celebrated the first graduation with graduates finding good jobs in the hospitality industry. It has been a huge success and we are increasing the number of trainees that will graduate next year. I would like to thank all involved, including members of the chamber, who helped with training and mentoring, but also those businesses that have hired young Caymanians who show that they are willing to be able, if only given a chance. Then there is the contentious issue of the cruise port, coupled with an enlarged cargo port. We have done as we promised and looked at the potential impact to the marine environment the influence on the land, and importantly, on how to best mitigate the environmental concerns while considering the benefits to the economy. I would pause here to note that this is something no other government has ever done. I'll say a bit more about the port shortly. We'll have already seen phase one of the Georgetown revitalization efforts started with the widening of key roads in Georgetown. It is part of an overall plan for improving our main town center. Again, I will speak more on this a little later. We also took on two issues that had been championed by the chamber for many years, Sunday trading and daylight savings time. Some were happy with the outcome of these efforts, others less so. But we expanded the variety of small businesses that can legally open on Sundays, satisfying a real economic need creating more employment opportunities, and protecting many small retail operations that partly rely on Sunday trade to remain in business. As for daylight savings time, we have approved its introduction and it will come into effect next year. We took on many key issues that previous administrations failed to tackle, all the while getting the country's finances and economy back in good order. This is no small feat. We now have a budget that failing some worldwide financial disaster will bring us back to full compliance with the public management and finance law tests by the end of this fiscal year. It is a budget that continues this government's firm control over expenditure and delivers strong revenues and surpluses while looking to 
to reduce the tax burden on people and businesses. I should also add that we have not increased any fees or taxes since we took office, and we have no intention of doing so for the remainder of this term. So President Barra, I hope that helps deal with the concern that you expressed in that regard. Government's net operating surplus has increased from about 56 million prior to the elections to about $124 million at the end of 2014-2015 financial year, and is projected to be $108 million in the current budget year. As striking as the increased surpluses are, they're even more impressive when you consider the almost $70 million given up by government over the past two budgets to accommodate the reduction in the CUC fuel import duty, the 2% reduction in the duty on most goods that businesses import, the reduction on license fees for many small businesses and other concessions and waivers, as well as the 4% cost of living adjustment for civil servants and other measures including e-government initiatives and support for Cineco. This equates to a $70 million economic stimulus that finds its way back into the economy. While the duty reductions help lower the price tag on many imported goods, as well as the cost of electricity. This is money that is going back into the pockets of individuals and businesses. And we intend to continue to responsibly lower fees and duties in the next budget as well. We have reduced government's core debt from $575 million at June 2013 to $503 million by June 2016, a decrease of $72 million, including paying off government's overdraft. Government has also established a debt service sinking fund that now has a balance of just over $18 million that can be drawn on to repay loans if needed. You know as well as I do, and President Barra acknowledged this, our economy is no longer at a standstill or in threat of sliding backwards, as was the case in early 2013. Business has improved for large and small companies and the prospects for further improvements can readily be seen. Our gross, our gross domestic product grew by 2.1% in 2014 and is expected to grow by a further 1.7% again, again this fiscal year. That is a reasonably acceptable rate of growth given the uncertainties that remain worldwide. In July 2015, the International Monetary Fund forecasted that the United States, with, the, with its huge, diverse economy, will have GDP growth of about 2.5% this year. We have an economy where stayover tourism numbers continue to grow, with the 2014 air arrivals of 383,000 being the most air arrivals we've had for 14 years. And air arrivals for this year continue to be good, with more than 280,000 visitors up to the 31st of August. Cruise arrivals have also grown with 1.61 million arrivals in 2014, an increase of almost 234,000 passengers over 2013. Indeed, 2014 was the highest number of cruise arrivals since 2007, a result of an improved relationship and dialogue with the Florida Caribbean Cruise Association. It didn't just happen by chance. And up to August of this year, we have already seen more than 1.1 million cruise visitors in Grand Cayman. This is a vital industry to many people and businesses in our society, and we have to ensure its continued success and growth. As more hotel rooms come online next year and beyond, we are confident that stayover tourism numbers will continue to grow, and we will ensure that our infrastructure is ready to handle that increase. And this confidence is shared by investors. Just last week, government signed an agreement for the construction of St. James Point, a $200 million hotel and condominium project that, we, that will be built in Beach Bay in the Bodentown District. It will benefit that district as well as the entire country, providing jobs and economic opportunities for hundreds of our people. Additionally, there are several new developments of varying sizes in the planning stage or under construction, 
including those on the Seven Mile Corridor along South Sound, out to the Eastern Districts and across the water to Cayman Brac. Developers from small to large have seen the improvement in the economy and are preparing for an increased demand as condos sell and tourist arrivals increase. This will help provide jobs and further enhance the economy as well as generate good government revenues. ERS is an economy where private sector jobs are again being created and with potential for more diversity in the economic base, including new opportunities in the proposed new maritime zone. Opportunities with changes to intellectual property laws and many changes to make our financial services sector more competitive, all of which promises growth. It takes time to rebuild, but we, government and the private sector, are doing well. But the indicators show that even with the improvements of the economy over the past two years, there is additional work to be done to ensure that more Caymanians have the opportunity to compete for the jobs for which they are qualified. I am happy to take on board any criticism around what government can do better and happy to consider any suggestions the Chamber may have. But in the spirit of partnership, the Cayman Islands Chamber of Commerce and its business members also have a responsibility to ensure that Caymanians who are capable and willing to work are treated fairly and have opportunities for employment and advancement. Together, we can solve this challenge. But let there be no misunderstanding. While we will continue to work with business to help grow the economy and create jobs, this government will not sit back and have Caymanians who are willing and capable to work be passed over. We recognize and value the contributions of all who work to help us build this economy. But with almost 22,000 work permits on record, it must be possible for businesses to hire more Caymanians. Besides employment for Caymanians, there are other challenges we face. For instance, the current grave concern that money transfer agencies no longer have access to Cayman banks. The reasons for this are complex, but essentially revolve around perceived risks posed by overseas regulators, concern that terrorists looking to fund their illegal efforts use money transfer companies. Those same regulators are also concerned that money transfer companies may also unknowingly be used to launder money. The increased scrutiny from authorities is especially focused on countries with a large volume of money transfers. Cayman, for instance, is reported to have $180 million in remittances annually that are sent from Cayman to Jamaica, Honduras, the Philippines, the USA, and elsewhere. As a result of this, the main bank servicing the money transfer businesses decided that the risks involved in continuing banking arrangements for money transfer businesses were too great. In addition, another local bank was forced to exit the business because of similar concerns by their correspondent bank in, in the US. On the face of it, these were business decisions presumably made in the best interest of the banks. But the impact of these decisions is that if the money transfer agents cannot bank deposits locally and have access to converting Cayman Islands dollars to US dollars to make their payments, then they will do exactly what they've done, accept US dollars only, and then ship the US cash overseas where a bank will deposit the money to its overseas account. The result has been an unexpected increased demand for US cash in Cayman and the banks have been running short. I am happy to say, however, that yesterday the Bankers Association confirmed to the Minister of Financial Services that the retail banks are now importing sufficient US cash to meet the increased local need for that cash and that the US cash crisis should ease shortly. But that really is a symptom of the problem rather than the problem itself. This issue is hurting many people in our communities and their families overseas who rely on remittances. Believe me, I understand this only too well. 
Between my home and my farm, I have four Jamaicans who work with me. And like everyone else, I scramble on Thursday and Friday to find sufficient U.S. cash to pay them because they can't get, as they have no accounts in any banks, they can't even buy U.S. cash from the banks even if they had it to sell. The issue is also damaging to our economy and we have to find a way to resolve it. The ministry together with SEMA has been working to find a solution that once again allows remitters to transact in Cayman Islands dollars. This really requires a commercial solution or a combination of commercial solutions. And government is doing everything we can to facilitate a resolution. We have already made some key decisions and I am optimistic that we will be able to announce at least a partial fix of the situation very shortly but because of the extremely sensitive nature of the commercial negotiations that are on the way. I regret I cannot say more about this at this particular moment. All I would wish to caution is that you do not believe the doom and gloom you hear on certain talk shows, radio talk shows, or the proposed solutions being so glibly expounded. If only it was as simple as they suggest. The Chamber has also highlighted to us the issue of Class B banks who are also facing challenges in retaining local bank accounts. I can say that SEMA and the Ministry are very aware of this and as such the Ministry has already contacted the Chamber's Chair of the Committee that is focused on this matter. In the near future, the Ministry will coordinate meetings with Class B banks that have concerns in order to better understand the nature of those concerns and figure out how best the ministry and government can assist. So here we are. While we face challenges, we also have a record of accomplishments that everyone in Cayman can be, a proud, can be proud of. We have less than two years remaining in this term, but I can assure you that your government is not sitting on its laurels. We know that there is still much work to be done, and we are pressing on with a renewed sense of urgency. Let me share with you some of our plans and pledges going forward. I mentioned earlier the progress that we have made regarding our waste management plans. But we will not sit and wait for a final strategy document to advise us on what everyone already knows. The solution must include plans for more recycling and composting. So government is moving forward with an expanded recycling program to collect waste papers, plastics, metals, and glass and keep them out of the landfill. A request for proposals will go out in October for the private sector to collect and process recyclables at the beginning of next year. In addition, a new program to process yard waste by composting and mulching will take place at the Georgetown landfill where most of the yard waste is already being delivered. The finished compost and mulch will be used for gardening and farming. We are also tackling the current unfair liquor licensing regime and a new liquor license bill will be taken to the Legislative Assembly at the next meeting, which commences on the 14th of October. This will remove the ability for liquor licenses to be treated as commodities to be leased and sold and thereby remove that black market and will allow a level playing field with regard to businesses that need these licenses to operate. Chamber members in the industry will appreciate the significance of this change. Another change that chamber members may appreciate is that Cabinet recently agreed to enhance the visa regime for Jamaicans traveling to Cayman by introducing a 10-year visa. This is expected to benefit business people, church officials, and others who need to travel to Cayman frequently. We are updating the public management and finance law. One planned improvement is for government to move to multi-year budgeting with the fiscal year being aligned with the calendar year. The amendments to the Public Management and Finance Law will be debated in the Legislative Assembly when we meet next month. Also to be debated are amendments to the Builder's Law that updates the legislation from 2007, which never was brought into force. This law will ensure proper qualifications and expertise 
of construction firms. Accompanying regulations will create registration categories from general contractors to tradesmen. Government has revamped the Government Guaranteed Home Assisted Mortgage Program and is relaunching it next month. We are working with local banks which have agreed to earmark between 50 and 60 million dollars for GGHAM mortgages. I wish to thank the banks for working with government to assist first-time Cayman, Caymanian homeowners. On the wider issues, we are delivering on our manifesto promises of education improvements, introducing a minimum wage, delivering on electoral reform, working with and encouraging business, improving employment, and revising the labor and pension laws. I really appreciate the Chamber's feedback on the labor and pensions law changes. As you know, we have extended the public consultation phase because we are interested in having true discourse. We are open to dialogue on this so as to ensure that we get the best bill possible that protects the rights of employees while ensuring that businesses are also treated fairly. Getting that delicate balance right is of critical importance and the government is under no illusion at the difficulty this poses. Without wishing in any way to detract from the seriousness of this matter, I believe this is one of those issues that US Vice President Joe Biden must have had in mind when he said, if we do everything right, if we do it with absolute certainty, there's still a 30% chance we're gonna get it wrong. E-government is also a priority. Just last week, we entertained a group from the Estonian E-Governance Academy. They held informative workshops to share with us what Estonia has done to catapult that country to the role as world leader in e-government initiatives, and we learned much. We are now looking to build on the e-services already in place and ensure that we move as one government and prioritize e-government initiatives that improve government services and better serve residents and businesses. One of the takeaways for me was their emphasis on the need for government systems and data to be secure and trusted. In today's world, as we have all seen, achieving cybersecurity and data protection is not a single destination, but a continuous journey. And I have advised the staff in the Minister of Home Affairs to ensure that there is a sufficient, urgent focus on data security across government. There is no place for complacency or second best when it comes to security and public confidence for which government has responsibility. <coughs> in terms of electoral reform, I can say today that I will shortly move the necessary motion in the Legislative Assembly to adopt the Electoral Boundary Commission's report in full and to introduce one person, one vote, and single member electoral districts in time for the next elections. We are moving to improve the green space in Georgetown including a new seaside park area in South Sound and a park in the vicinity of the old glass house. Plans for both are, an, are at an advanced stage and a, bit, and a major business, who's a member of the Chamber of Commerce, has agreed to fund the glass house park. I wish to thank them, even though they are yet anonymous. It is expected that this will be completed next year. Phase one of the Georgetown revitalization project will continue with new roads being introduced and existing roads enhanced to take the traffic away from the waterfront and town center. The next major road to be built will be the extension to the Linford Pearson Highway, extended in the sense of two more lanes from Bobby Thompson Way down to the roundabout by the Lions Center. It is anticipated that the public, including the business sector, will shortly be asked to add their voices to what is being proposed so we can have a plan that will provide true economic and social renewal for Georgetown, including the introduction of mixed-use bu buildings in the town center. The renewal of Georgetown will help bring businesses, jobs, and added opportunities back to the capital. 
Part and parcel of a renewed downtown Georgetown is cruise ship berthing and enlarged cargo facilities. The environmental impact assessment has indicated that while there will be some damage to reef structures in the immediate vicinity of the harbor, the project will not bring any harm to Seven Mile Beach. This was a major concern that has now been put to rest. The assessment also indicated other possible impacts to the marine environment in that area and advised how best to mitigate any damage. The economic benefits reports have also provided good insight and are helpful to government. What was also useful to elected members was public representation, including meetings with individuals on either side of this issue. While Cabinet is still to make a formal decision, which is expected over the next few weeks. I can say today that government has considered the matter carefully and has agreed on the merits of building a cruise port and an enhanced cargo port and to allow the project to proceed to the next stage. The next stage involves discussions with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, government and cruise companies, which are needed regarding the design of the piers and the structure of the project's financing. The cruise companies must have major skin in the game as they are needed to guarantee the necessary volume of cruise passengers over the financing period. I hasten to add that there will, be, there will not be dredges in Georgetown Harbor tomorrow or next week or next month. Instead, we will proceed carefully and seek to do whatever it takes to ensure the minimum environmental impact. We will take the time necessary to plan and engineer the building of the piers, including planning any logistics, and to look carefully at mitigation methods. In considering the engineering of the piers, we intend to carefully assess whether the current design elements, including the alignment of the piers, can be further improved to reduce the impact of dredging. The project will not only help safeguard our important cruise business into the future, but it will also enlarge our cargo port. Both will protect existing jobs as well as bring many new jobs during the project phase, leading to many hundreds of more jobs well into the future. I have heard what those who worry about the environmental impact have said. But one thing is certain in my mind. Economic benefits aside, if we continue to anchor cruise ships in the Georgetown Harbor, as we have done these past 40 years, in a decade or two, there will be very little coral there for anybody to enjoy or argue about. We, as a government, are being called upon by the proponents and opponents of a cruise port to decide on protecting the environment or protecting the economy. Life is seldom so cut and dried, but we firmly believe that our approach will find the right balance. The decision to be made is not whether we want to build cruise berthing. The decision is whether we want to remain in the cruise business in any significant way. The decision is whether the many hundreds of people and families who today rely on jobs created as a result of cruise tourism will have those jobs next year and in the years to come. Our view is that we have spent 40 years building an important cruise tourism economic driver and we are duty bound to ensure that we do not sit still and allow it to move to Cuba or other destinations in the region. As an indication of how important this is to our economy, from cruise year May 2014 to April 2015, there were 1.45 million cruise passengers who visited Grand Cayman. They spent an average of four hours on shore and generated $160.9 million. Further, it cannot be ignored that of the 22 countries in the Caribbean and Central America at which cruise ships currently call, the only one that does not have or is not in the process of building cruise pairs is the Cayman Islands. I know some of us are fond of bucking the trend, but I'm not sure this is one we want to buck. As is always the case, there will be some sacrifice to ensure future success. Continuing to look to the future, 
This government plans to introduce a modern national development plan that will help us sustain economic help us sustain economic prosperity, prevent further degradation of our environment, plan physical development, and ensure physical infrastructural needs are continually met. The initial work for this will begin in earnest in the coming months and will be part and parcel of the work being done to implement the various projects under Project Future. Last year in my speech, I talked about the EY report. I said then that the report was a useful starting point for the government as it addressed the need for public sector reform in these islands. It was clear that some recommendations from EY were already part of our plans, while others we could rule out even at that early stage. I promise you at this very same luncheon last year that all the other recommendations would be subject to a thorough review before decisions were made to ensure that the changes made were in the best interest of our people. I'm delighted to announce that the review of the EY recommendations is just about complete. We have found a number of recommendations are not compatible with the direction we are seeking to take, but the majority of the EY report, we believe, should be taken forward either directly or in a suitably modified form. In a few cases, we have made a start on some of the more straightforward suggestions. For example, we have made good progress on the development of both the Single Utilities Commission and a new office of the Ombudsman. We are progressing the proposal to increase the retirement age of civil servants, and only a few weeks ago, Cabinet agreed to take to market the first area of land identified as surplus. Taken together, the Y recommendations we are accepting and any new projects we have identified represent an ambitious and comprehensive package of reform that will be taken forward under the Project Future banner. We will be announcing the full details of the program in the next few weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, if I am to summarize, we are a little more than two years into this term, and our initial focus on restoring stability to the country, restoring confidence in the government, and restoring the economy and government finances have broadly been achieved. We are a government of ambition and action. We are a progressive government and we will continue to work hard to ensure that we never go back to the dark political and economic days of recent memory. We've risen too far out of the mire and we ain't going back. As I've said elsewhere, there can be no going back to the days of personality politics and governments working towards political survival Instead, what we must continue to have is a government focused on what is best for the people it was elected to serve. In the words of the late John F. Kennedy, let us not seek to fix the blame for the past. Let us accept our own responsibility for the future. The government which I have the honor to lead has accepted our responsibility for the future and we are forging forward. We have done well, even if I say so myself, over these past two years, and we know that there is much more to do. We are a government that gets things done. In closing, it only remains for me to thank my team, ministers and councillors, as well as the speaker and deputy speaker for their commitment, discipline, and hard work. I also wish to thank Her Excellency the Governor for her wide for her wise counsel and support of the government. I also thank the Deputy Governor and the Attorney General, as well as the Cabinet Secretary, for the very vital roles they play. Of course, we would get very little done were it not for the support of the wider public service, as well as my staff in the office of the Premier, and I thank them as well. Finally, I thank President Barry Borden the Chamber Council and the members of the Chamber of Commerce for once again hosting this legislative luncheon and providing me with this opportunity to update, update you on the government's progress. I appreciate your being such a patient and gracious audience and affording me the honor to address you here today. Thank you.